thanks very much. I feel I have to apologize, not only for being American, but even being a Texan. So, you know, it wasn't my fault. I didn't choose it. <laughs> so 10 years ago, uh, in 2008, I was uh, working with the BBC writing two plays about Enron. And I think they chose me because I was the only playwright they knew who could also read a balance sheet. I've run five companies in my life. And um, at the time, I was reading the transcript of the trial of Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay. And in that transcript, I came across a really interesting idea. The judge, in his summing up to the jury, cited the legal concept of willful blindness. If there are things you could have known and should have known and somehow managed not to know, he explained, the law deems that you've been willfully blind. You could have known, you had an opportunity for knowledge, but you shirked it. And I thought this is a really deeply interesting idea. It kind of, it was a bit like a magnet thrown in a bunch of, of the sort of iron filings of my brain and suddenly kind of all the history I'd ever known kind of swooped around this idea. And at the same time, of course, as you all know, the bank started to collapse and the whole commentary around it was, oh my goodness, we couldn't possibly have known. And I remember shouting at the radio, as is my habit, and saying, don't be stupid, everybody knew. Everybody knew, everybody knew that Britain was drowning in debt. Everybody knew that everything had been financialized out of existence. Don't tell me you didn't know. And I suddenly thought, there it is, there it is again. It's this willful blindness thing. And in a kind of white heat, I sat down and thought about, okay, so what is it, how does it work, where do we see it? I thought about the Catholic Church in Ireland. I thought about good Germans during the war. I thought about uh, families and adultery and how is it the wife's always the last to know? And I thought, oh my God, there's a lot of this willful blindness stuff around. How come we don't think about it, talk about it? Why are we willfully blind, if you like, to willful blindness? So, um, so I set on a mission, really, to try to understand how did this happen? And I ended up writing a book which looked at all sorts of things from BP's staggeringly high fatality rate before Texas City, at Texas City, and subsequently in Deepwater Horizon. I looked at the Catholic Church in Ireland I looked at sun tanning. I looked at the fact that, you know, publicly funded authorities still offer sun lounges. I looked at personal debt. I looked at huge amounts of fraud. I've become incredibly friendly with a large number of fraudsters, which my husband's a bit suspicious about, but they're really interesting people, trust me. Um, I looked, of course, at the financial crisis and inevitably, I was going to end up, wasn't I, with climate change. And I wrote a book on the subject, and um, the head of the SEC came up to me and he said it was the only thing that had ever explained business to him, which I thought was a little scary. And I sort of thought, well, there it is. You see, I've done it. I've explained how it works. I've explained what the antidotes are, and that's it. Now it'll disappear. And rather sadly, a few months ago, I delivered the second edition of Willful Blindness, um, which will come out next year, because obviously after things like Brexit and Trump and Me Too, obviously I failed in my mission to eliminate Willful Blindness. But the thing I've learned in the meantime is that while I was focusing on obvious disasters, sins of commission, if you like, I had missed something myself, which were the errors of omission. So, for example, I lived in the States in the 90s running high-tech companies, and at that time, one of the things that kind of startled all of us was when Netscape went public, and Microsoft, it turns out, the biggest, most important software company at the time, didn't so much as have a browser, an internet browser in development. Microsoft missed the internet. It went on <laughs> to miss database technology. It came really late to games. It missed mobile. It missed la natural language search. So you thought, wow, this is really something. 
how is it this incredible company packed full of smart people missed all this stuff to the point that people were until recently starting to write off the whole business. And then I talked to people in packaged good companies who talked about how since the 1980s they'd been trying to persuade their American masters that yes, water was a product and yes, you could get people to pay real money for it. And then later on I talked to my pals at Intercontinental Hotels Group who were absolutely convinced that Airbnb wasn't a threat to them. <laughs> and then I talked to my pals at Google and said, hang on a second, I know you guys think you are the smartest, most original, most creative, free-thinking contrarians in the universe. So how exactly is it that you missed social networking completely? Completely. And the only answer I got that made sense, even though it's a really bad answer, the only answer I got was Eric Schmidt. I said, what do you mean, Eric Schmidt? He said, well, he didn't tell us to look at it. I said, you're not serious. You're not telling me something has to catch Eric's eye before you give yourself permission to say, this is kind of interesting, we should think about it? And it just struck me that actually, as while I'd been focusing on the kind of obvious disasters in which people die, there was this whole other flip side of willful blindness, which was the complete failure of people to see creative opportunities that are staring them in the face. And I thought that was kind of interesting because it occurred to me that actually the causes were identical. So I'm going to run through those really quickly, and then because I don't want us all to die of despair, I'll spend you know, the bulk of time talking about, so who are the people and processes and things that somehow might provide some kind of antidote to this. So having studied all these cases, you know, there are a whole kind of um, nest, if you like, of causes here. The first, which I think is now pretty well understood, is that we tend to hang out with people like ourselves. We like people like ourselves. We mostly marry people who are roughly the same height, hair color, eye color, religious beliefs, political beliefs, and so on. We go around the world looking for people who are just like us, and when we meet them, we generally think they're fantastic. Right? And we read the newspapers we agree with, we watch the TV shows that we agree with, and we all go along in this fabulous kind of haze of, con of affirmation which means that we rarely have our own biases and prejudices and sheer wrong information challenged. So that means that actually, whereas we might be able to see a lot in the world, in fact, we choose to focus on a very, very slender slice of it. So, of course, we're going to miss a ton of stuff. In addition, we often work in places and in ways that guarantees we'll miss more. So, in the course of writing the book, I became kind of an expert in industrial accidents, and there are a couple of things that always, always, always are found in major industrial accidents. Uh, the first is sleep deprivation, that when people are tired, they can't think. The first thing that goes is their ability to think for themselves. So, when you have missed a night's sleep, the part of your brain responsible for critical thinking kind of takes over in order to keep you awake. From an evolutionary perspective, it's much more important to be awake than to be able to think about what you're doing. Right? If you're walking through a jungle and a tiger jumps at you, much more important to be awake than to think what might the motivations of the tiger be. Right? So what you had at places like BP facilities was you had a lot of people who were spectacularly sleep deprived and when something goes wrong they literally physically don't have the cognitive capacity to think through what might be happening and how might they avert disaster. So you run people for hours and hours and hours, very 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 long shifts, you give them very few breaks and eventually they're state of their brain is pretty similar to being over the alcohol limit. So we do this a lot. We put executives on planes and, you know, we send them to fly overnight and then they jump into rental cars and zoom down the highway. And you can do the experiments where you make people miss a night's sleep or drink a lot of vodka. And if you ever have to make this choice in life, you're much better off with the drunks. Okay? <laughs> 
So a lot about the way that we work people guarantees they won't be able to think even though that's what you're paying them for. Right? Multitasking, exactly the same thing. As Nick said at the beginning, you can only think about one thing at a time. When you pretend that you're multitasking, you're task switching really, really quickly, which means between task A and task B, there's this thing where there's nothing in your head. In addition, because we've been trying to get people to work like this for a long time, what we now know is that when you work like that, switching tasks all the time, you really lose the ability to retrieve a lot of the information that is in there somehow. So it's as if you pick up a piece of information and throw it on the floor and do that all day long, and then somebody asks you a question and you know the answer is somewhere, you just can't find it. So a lot of the stuff that we think is so cool, I can be on the phone and typing on my laptop, you know, while doodling, it's just a crap way to work. And if you think you can do it, you're definitely blind. Because you can't, nobody can, women can't, I know it's supposed to be our great contribution to the workplace that we're multitaskers. I think that's just an excuse to get us to do two jobs for the price of one. <laughs> Don't do it. It's really dangerous, it's tiring, and it leaves you stupid. Now, the whole premise of being in an organization is the wisdom of crowds, right? We've got all these clever people, all you clever people in an organization will know more, will be able to come up with more ideas and so on. And it's a fantastic idea. It's a fantastic idea. But there are lots of problems when you bring people together. And one of them is that they will see things going wrong. I can tell you legions of stories about NHS hospitals where everybody knows, everybody knows, Annie's a really dangerous nurse. Jack's a really dangerous surgeon. But they're not going to tell you. Fantastic little statistic, one of my favorites. In a study where you bring together a lot of executives and you ask them about their work, and you ask, do you have issues and concerns at work that you don't voice? The answer comes back, yes, from 85% of people question. That is a really big number. That implies that of the 100 people you've hired, you're getting nothing from any but 15 of them. Of course, there were lots of people at Google that thought Facebook was interesting. Of course, there were lots of people working in Rotherham who thought something was up. But nobody said a word. Often what happens is they'll kind of talk to each other in a gossipy banter kind of way. God, I'm glad Jack's not operating on my child today. And they kind of think that that's doing something, but it's not doing anything. Gosh, I wish Eric would take a look at Facebook. It's not much of an action item, really. This is really challenging to anybody running a team or an organization. Assume people have ideas in their head that they're not telling you and think about. What are you doing to get them out? Or what are you doing to ensure that they keep their lips sealed? There are quite a lot of things that drive this behavior. One is we are mostly, and I know you all will think that you are not part of this group, but trust me, statistically, you are. Mostly people are obedient, right? We know this from Stanley Milgram's experiments into obedience, some of the most robust social science there is which is, by and large, if you ask a whole bunch of people to do something wildly unethical, for the most part, they'll do it. Because, as Milgram wrote, when we go into work, our focus shifts from wanting to be a good person to wanting to do a good job. And we mostly think doing a good job means doing what you're told. So we are, we might think we're not obedient, but on the whole, we are. Milgram's teacher was another social psychologist named Solomon Ash, and Ash 
studied conformity. The difference between the two, obedience is about formal authority. It comes from your boss. Conformity is informal authority. It comes from your peers. And Ash devised this fantastic experiment where you get a whole bunch of people in a room, you give them a super, super simple question, like, of my three fingers, which finger on my other hand matches which one on my left hand in length? Everybody can tell the answer. Like all social science experiments, there's a catch, and the catch is most people have been told to give the wrong answer. The onus of the experiment is on the people who haven't. By and large, they will give the wrong answer. We are very social creatures, and we would much rather be wrong than isolated. And again, you saw this in Rotherham and in the NHS endlessly. I know the doctor is dangerous. I know the nurse is mean. I know that there's something going on with taxi drivers and young women. But I'm not going to say anything, because nobody around me is saying anything, so why should I? Sadly, um, this, this experiment was repeated recently using MRI scanners because there was a desire to know at the, this moment of conformity what's happening inside the human brain. And what they found was, once again, as soon as people were asked the question and knew what everybody else had said, by and large, they would conform. But what was so striking looking at the brain scans is that the part of the brain responsible for visual cognition didn't even light up. In other words, it's not that people were thinking, well, I know the right answer, but I want to belong. They weren't thinking at all. Right? Sadly, the research has been used to figure out you know, clever ways to sell things like Fifty Shades of Grey, which seems to be a terrible waste of social science. <laughs> but I think it's, you know, it's really chastening to think about how this happens. And I suspect everybody in this room has been in meetings where it happens, where somebody suggests something and everybody goes along with it. And afterwards you think, well, that was kind of stupid, or mad, or bad, or wrong, or illegal, or unethical, or just really kind of crap, right? So we're obedient, we're conformist, and then we get management, right? scientific management, as it has come to be known. I was really amazed to hear the chief exec of Amazon UK the other day saying, you know, due to scientific management, we now know how to manage people. So now we just have to figure out how to manage machines. Well, I, you know, with all due respect, I don't think we have learned how to manage people. I think we think we know how to manage people. And we think we can manage people by things like targets and KPIs and benchmarks and goals and all this kind of stuff. And in a way, you could say that it works because by and large, when you give people this huge kind of elaborate labyrinth to navigate, they will do their best. They really will. The problem is, of course, that when you tell them exactly what to do, what they take from that is don't do anything else. So if the house is burning down and it doesn't say on your KPIs to call the fire department, nobody will. Which is, by the way, exactly what happened in financial services. Here are your goals, here's your margin, here's what you have to make this week, this day, this hour. Oh, the economy's going down the tank. Too bad, it's not your problem. And then you add on to that huge amounts of financial incentives because somebody somewhere thought that if you didn't offer a financial incentive, people wouldn't be motivated. And something else really weird happens. Huge battery of fantastic experiments show that when you start getting people to think about money, their concern for other people pretty much vanishes. So there, again, there's a neat little experiment where a whole bunch of people are taken into a lab and they're, ta they're talked to about money and they're promised rewards for all sorts of participation in experiments. And then as they're leaving, a woman crosses the room and drops a box of pencils. And the people who've been talking about money all morning generally keep walking. 
It's only the rest that will stop and say, do you need a hand? And you can do a million different weird variants of this. But essentially, it's a kind of cognitive load issue, which is if I'm thinking about money, I'm thinking about me. If I'm thinking about me, I am not thinking about you. But we think this is really motivating. And then we tell people, oh, by the way, please be really collaborative. Right? <laughs> so this is mostly how we manage people. We think that people are like machines, and if we manage them like machines and we kind of twiddle the knobs and get the gradations exactly right and fine-tuned, that then they'll do exactly what we want. But the big problem in business, as in most walks of life, is we're not quite sure what we want. And one of the reasons we hire super smart, creative, imaginative, fun people is we want their ideas. And then we put them inside this superstructure that pretty much guarantees that they won't have any ideas. I'm amazed that I spend a huge amount of my life going around and working with corporations, telling them, please let people leave the office. Because I keep asking them, when was the last time you had a great idea behind your desk? Nobody ever had a great idea behind their desk. They had a great idea driving home, in the shower, walking the dog, almost anywhere except work. Because work has become a machine in which we will play exactly our part and nothing else. So all those people who didn't mention Facebook, all those people at Intercontinental Hotels Group who were staying in Airbnbs because they were so much more fun than their hotels, <laughs> they didn't talk about that at work because they weren't told to, they weren't asked to. And just in case, I mean, I can't imagine you would think this, but just in case you're thinking, well, then all you really need to do is tell people to kind of come in and be creative, and they will. And of course, we all know there's nothing worse than being told to be creative unless it's being told to be funny, right? So there's a huge amount about the way that we have constructed work that I think isn't deliberately designed to kill contrarians. That's just what it does. And it's one reason why lots of people leave to set up their own businesses. It's one reason people leave to go and work in the coffee shop down the street. It's one reason people feel pretty pissed off and disenchanted. Because the promise of work is so great. And the reality for most people is such crap. And then if we're really, really desperate, which, and this is what certainly a lot of, com of large American companies do, we think, well, this is so bad, we need to kind of really get people more motivated, and we've tried the money thing, but that doesn't quite work. So let's get them to compete with each other. We could have teams competing for a pitch. There's a novel concept. Wouldn't that be great? And of course, what do they find? You find that people are subverting each other, that instead of getting two, three, four fabulous pitches, you have everybody just figuring out, how do I make the other teams fail? Right? Steal their budget, pour coffee cups over their printed collateral, you know, all that kind of stuff. We've always thought, oh, if we could get everybody to compete more, they'd be more effective. But actually, it's just like school. It's just like science. It's just like sport. The higher the intensity of competition, the higher level of cheating and corruption. So management, as we've done it so far, generally is a bit of a bust. And I think it's really important for us to figure out not so much how we got here, but how we get out of here. So, of course, when I was writing Wolf of Blindness, I kept thinking, because there were times I felt pretty terminally, you know, desperate. I kept thinking, but come on, Margaret, there are people who do see stuff. There are people who stand up and say, we have a problem. So what about them? Who are they? Where are they? How do we identify them? Could we find more of them? These are your contrarians. And I went, spent, oh, wasted actually months going through all the literature on uh, whistleblowers 
and kind of corporate radicals and all these sorts of people. Because I thought, maybe if I can look at all of these cases, I can find some common theme, and then we'll know who these people are and where they come from and what they look like. And I think in my head I had a fantasy they would all be six foot tall with red hair and therefore really easy to spot. Sadly, that turned out not to be true. In fact, what was really interesting was that the more I read, the more elusive this became. And the other thing that I discovered is that when you really dug into these cases, these were people who were very, very ordinary. They weren't the people with super high IQs. They mostly hadn't gone to posh colleges. Few of them had PhDs. And the hopeful part of that was, well, if they were that ordinary, Maybe we could all be them if we thought of in a different way and if we treated each other in some different ways. So I spent a lot of time talking to these people to try to understand how did they think, how did they work, and what motivated them. One of the cases that I looked at in a lot of detail because it was just such a sensational story was this story of a Oxford physician named Alice Stewart, who had done the biggest ever study of childhood cancers and concluded, this is in the 50s, that the reason that childhood cancers was on the increase was because the British medical establishment was x-raying pregnant women. And she concluded from her research that this was generally a very bad idea. Uh, the British medical establishment took 25 years before they agreed with her. And I thought, but how do you keep going for 25 years? How can you be sure you're right for 25 years when you've got the whole of the British establishment against you? And what I discovered was that Alice had a fantastic collaboration with a statistician named George Neal. And George and Alice were as different as it's possible for two people to be. So Alice, very gregarious, sociable, everybody loved her. George was what we might call a nerd, I guess, which is he didn't like going out, he didn't like people very much, he much preferred numbers. But he did say something quite profound. He said, my job is to prove that Dr. Stewart is wrong. Because if I can't, if I can't find any other explanation for the data, then she'll go back and have the argument. George was a kind of hired contrarian, if you like. He appreciated that his gift to her was a good fight because it gave her confidence, it made her think harder, and it made her look for more data, different data, to be certain that this fight was worth it. And I think it was Nick, I can't remember, but someone earlier this morning talked about collaboration as you have to get along with everybody and collaboration is really this, supposed to be this kind of lovey-dovey kind of, um, I don't know, kind of dance. And actually when you start talking to really, really great collaborators, when you start talking to actors and directors, filmmakers and actors, filmmakers and cameramen, musicians, you know, the really great collaborators are what the Wright brothers described as scrappy. They're deeply dissatisfied with what their collaborators have to offer. It's like, okay, that's a good place to start, but what about this, and what about that, and what if we did it this way, and what if you turned it upside down, and actually, what if you just shut the fuck up for a few minutes and let me play, right? So collaboration, I think, gets a bad press because the idea is, oh, we all have to get along. No, you specifically don't have to get along. You have to think about what is my contribution here, not does this fit my KPI, not what does my boss want to hear, but what can I add that makes this a richer, deeper, more uncomfortable conversation? What's the very best question I could ask? What's the gating factor here? Why is this gonna fail? When it has failed, what will we know we did wrong today? What piece of information would change your mind? 
who else is there who could really, really kick the tires of this? Why would anyone make this against the law? What are we missing? How do you know? One of the contrarians I interviewed is a guy named Herb Meyer, who came up with one of the best questions I've ever heard. He was second in charge of intelligence in the Reagan administration, and he used to go to what apparently were very dreary intelligence briefings all the time, where the generals would, would tell him and the heads of intelligence would tell him, uh, everything's fine, Cold War's great, you know, we've counted the tanks, all our spies say life is business as usual. And Herb was a really smart thinker. And he said, you know, when all the data is consistent, you know something isn't being found. You need to look for the noise. There's got to be noise around here somewhere. Seek disconfirmation. So he came up with this great question, because he kept saying, oh, I don't think so, I'm not sure, but, you know, that's not much of an argument. And he said... Well, what if I were right and you were wrong? What would we see then? It's one of the best questions I've ever come across. And they said, all right, let's give Herb five minutes. If he were right that the Soviet Union was on the brink of collapse, which of course it isn't, what would we see? And they sort of brainstormed a list. And he said, okay, now send that out to the spy networks and let's see what happens. And if I'm as stupid as you say, nothing will happen. The first piece of information they get, some, partis some um, partisans have attacked a meat train in the Ukraine, the Red Army's been called out, and suddenly, for some reason nobody knows, the Red Army's told, it's okay, look, there's lots of meat on the train, let the peasants have it, just go home. Well, this isn't what happens in a really successful economy, generally. And of course, everything on Herb's list suddenly, suddenly, became visible because they were looking for different things in different places in different ways. What would we see if we were wrong? It's a kind of priming. Talking about it, thinking about it, makes it much more likely that you're going to see it. Another guy that I talked to, who was famous for having refused to work for Enron, ran a big ad, ad agency in Austin, Texas. And I said to him, Roy, why? Everybody in America was flying to Houston to try to do business with Enron. My chief investor told me to go and do a deal with Enron, and I refused to, but I didn't understand why Roy had. And he gave me all kinds of, forgive me, advertising bullshit reasons why he had. Um, and then, and I said, but, but that doesn't explain it. And he said, okay, here's something different. Maybe this will help you. And he explained to me that when he was growing up, he had a sister with cystic fibrosis. And he used to take her to school every day in a wheelchair. And he said, I would watch people watching us. And I would see that they felt really sorry for us. And they felt really sorry for my sister. And I used to think, but they can't see how much we love her and what a great life she has and what a huge, valuable contribution she makes to our family. And then he went a step further, and he said, and that made me think, if they're missing so much about me, how much am I missing about them? And he said, it just became my kind of operating principle to assume I'm wrong or I'm missing something. And going into a discussion assuming you're wrong is a very different experience from going in to, as the jargon goes, land your argument. It means you hear differently, it means you listen differently, and it means that when you're taking your dog for a walk, very, very different kinds of ideas jump into your head. When I was running tech companies in the States, I used to joke with my chief creative officer that I wish it was illegal to say on our uh, recruiting ads that we really only wanted to hire people from dysfunctional families. Um, because we started to notice that actually all the best people in the company were from dysfunctional families, ourselves included. And we talked about that, and what we realized was that if you've had the experience of growing up in a family where people lie all the time, 
then you start not to believe anything you're told. And this is a fantastic adaptation to reality because it means you interrogate everything. Why are you saying it? What's in it for you? What could the opposite story be? You go through life not exactly, not exactly distrustful, but certainly very skeptical. And nowhere more so than when you're told, well, Margaret, it's either this or that. Right? This is Margaret's new rule of thumb. The minute it's binary, it's wrong. Somebody's trying to sell you something. There is always at least a third option. There are usually about three or four or 500 more. Right? When you're offered a binary, it's called propaganda. So that's the moment at which you think, OK, now I know I'm being lied to. Now I need to think again. The other thing I would say about all the whistleblowers that I talked to is that they all had allies. Now, some had very scrappy allies, like Alice Stewart, but they all had people they could talk to and say, I wonder about this, I wonder about that. What do you think? Now, I don't think that's very remarkable, except I teach on a leadership program, and about two years ago, for various reasons, I said, I think we should do a session on friendship. I just, I, you know, I, I don't know why, I just have this instinct, and it was partly because one of my closest friends had died, and I'd suddenly realized how kind of empty my life was, but I said, let's do something about friendship, and we got some fantastic CEOs to come in and talk about how in moments of enormous, enormous pressure and crisis, their friends had helped them. And then I went walking with some of the executives on the program, and every single one of them said to me, you know, I used to have friends. And I don't anymore. You know, I've got a wife, I've got kids, I've got work. And I don't have time for friends anymore. And I said, but what about friends at work? They looked at me like I just suggested something illegal. <laughs> now, part of the problem was lots of them work in companies with forced ranking. And forced ranking, of course, is a way you get everybody to compete with each other. And you're not going to make friends with the person who might push you down the ranking, right? So these competitive environments are toxic for friendships. But you have got to have friends at work. I don't just mean colleagues, and I don't just mean allies. I mean friends. I mean friends who will come and say, Margaret, really, just shut up now. Everybody's sick of you. Or who'll come and say, you know that thing you said? What did you mean? Or the people you can go to and say, I'm really worried about this. I had a client once who, said, who came to me and said, I'm so appalled by the sexual harassment in my company, I want to leave. And I said, well, I think that's great. Nice you have principles. Sorry about the sexual harassment, obviously. But here's the thing, have you tried everything? And he looked kind of shocked. And he said, what would everything mean? I said, I don't know. Don't you have some friends you can talk to about this and figure out what to do? And he said, I might have one. That's, that'll do. And he went and he talked to his friend and his friend said, but I feel the same way. And that friend talked to another friend who also felt the same way. So now what could they do? Now they could go to the chairman and say, we have a problem, which trust me is a lot easier than saying, I have a problem. Because he had friends, he suddenly was able to do something and the friends held each other to account. And whether you have something that concerns you, bothers you, makes you uncomfortable at work, or whether you have a great idea that nobody's paid attention to, trust me, that's the moment you need some friends. That's the moment you have to be able to think for yourself, get some challenge, 
fact, check your facts and move forward. It's almost impossible to do alone. And the last thing I'd say, because I'm always aware, you know, you have, the companies are full of people with great ideas and insights and concerns, and they mostly aren't voiced. And I'm intrigued by what gets people over the edge from thinking about them to doing something about them. And there's a whole range of things. Friends, definitely. Really great people to argue with, definitely. Really wonderful questions, for sure. A good night's sleep definitely helps you think. But the key thing I notice is that the people who are willing to do this work really believe that it matters. I asked Sharon Watkins why she was the only person in Enron to write a letter to the chairman saying, I think we have some accounting problems here. And she said, oh, she said well, I grew up in a small community where if something was wrong, you did something about it because you thought that what you did mattered. And increasingly in the companies that I'm working in today, I certainly have that sense of the real leaders who, by the way, are usually not on the org chart, the real leaders have a sense that they take this personally. They realize it's not just their job, it's their life. But the thing I've heard in the last few months that I've never heard before in my career is this. I just keep wondering what I'm going to say if my kids ask me what I did in the war. There's a sense I have in companies now that actually what we all do matters. That as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us, actually we haven't even started. When Shell's scenario includes the fact that we won't make the Paris Accord target, there are a lot more people saying, how am I going to explain this? I had opportunity, I had power, I had ideas, I had creativity. What did I do with them? Thank you.